Good afternoon. Welcome to session five of European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford Engineering School. My name is Burton Lee. Today, our session, which we're very excited to present because we have a number of people from some of Europe's leading publications, tech, news, business media, coming in the case of one, of one of our guests all the way from London to be with us to talk about European media in Silicon Valley and tech reporting in Europe. So this is a departure from our traditional uh, speakers where we present typically entrepreneurs, founders, and investors. Uh, the purpose of this session is to broaden the discussion a little bit about the broader issue of tech reporting in Europe and how European media reports Silicon Valley. But also, if you're a Valley startup thinking of going to Europe, you may recall last week we did a session on European market entry strategies. How do you engage European media, leading print and online media if you're a startup? How do you get their attention? which is very important if you're particularly in the consumer space. Uh, we're really honored to have Mike Butcher here from TechCrunch Europe, all the way from London. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Rosa Jimenez. Uh, Rosa, do you, with the Cano or sin, con Cano or oh. sin Cano? From, As you like. I'm getting used to be called like my mom, which is okay. Rosa Cano. Uh, from El País, out of Spain and Madrid. Jérôme Marin, based in San Francisco, uh, representing Le Monde, correspondent for Le Monde and Matthias Hohenze from Wirtschaftswoche, meaning uh, Economics Business Weekly out of Germany, one of Germany's largest uh, business newspapers. Uh, during the course of the discussion, uh, I hope we can figure out actually cumulatively how many readers you hit each week as publications. I'd like to add up those numbers just to see how much impact these four publications have in Europe. I think it's in the well over 5 million across Europe, maybe even over 10 million. What's the, what's the circulation for El País today? Um, it depends on the print edition. We have yeah. uh, barely 200,000 print uh, every day, but it's something that is like year by year going 10% down, 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 and there's no way to right. stop it. Se several million readers yeah, uh, but in, a day. Yeah, and the printed on the website, we had uh, 12, uh, 12 million unique users monthly. Okay. So and that's it's going up, and it's so part if, of the if, strategy. I'm if you include Le Mans, Virtual Talk, and TechCrunch, uh, major impact in terms of re readership across Europe. Um, I invite you to visit the home pages of TechCrunch Europe, El País, based out of Madrid. Le Monde out of Paris, and Wirtschaftswoche. Uh, Matthias, Wirtschaftswoche is based out of um, Düsseldorf. Düsseldorf. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, what are the questions, what we're going to be talking about? Uh, how can startups get the attention of major European print and online media? What major issues do European tech media report on Silicon Valley? What do they think it's, is important here in the Valley? Uh, how well or poorly is tech innovation entrepreneur, entrepreneurship reported today in major European establishment press? And what can Silicon Valley learn from Europe? So it's a very wide-ranging set of topics. Uh, we're going to do uh, have short presentations from each speaker first, one or two questions for each speaker. But then we're going to go to panel Q&A, where we do encourage you uh, to basically th throw your hardball and softball <laughs> questions uh, at, at will. They're all here to uh, engage, engage with you. So um, also encourage you to tweet. We've uh, included the Twitter handles of all the speakers. Uh, please, please do give them your, uh, your best Twitter attention. Uh, our first speaker will be Mike. So this is me. Um, uh, yes, so, uh, but that, ignore that stuff. I'll happily answer questions in emails. That's for all the entrepreneurs who, who, who hound me for their pitches. But goodness me, I love them because aren't they making all the stuff that we love today? Right, so um, I've been a TechCrunch um, for a while. Uh, back in the day, I um, was uh, um, a jobbing journalist with uh, Financial Times, The Guardian, uh, editing magazines, newspapers, etc. Not editing the newspapers much. Uh, but writing for them, and um, I um, ma happened to meet Michael Arrington, a uh, chap you might know his name, who was starting a blog called TechCrunch in Atherton. I thought, said, this is fantastic. He, I met him in a pub in London, actually. He'd invited a few people over for drinks. About 150 of us turned up, and I was one of them. And uh, and uh, we kept in touch. And this was back in the day when people used to refer to the explosion of innovation that we all know and love uh, as Web 2.0. What a, what a sort of anachronistic term that is now, isn't it? But, uh, so, but I realized that this was going to be really fun and really has a 
journalist who'd been covering technology and new media since the, since the early 1850 era, um, I was excited about the new wave. So, and this seemed to be the kind of title that I wanted to work with. So off I went. And anyway, so I uh, ended up working on various things. Um, I was on a, a, ma a magazine that came out of San Francisco called The Industry Standard. Uh, and you're all far too young to remember that, of course. Um, but it was great fun, and it was kind of a, the tech crunch of its era. Um, so in the last few years, I've dabbled in other things as well as being a writer. I helped start up a non-profit called CODEC, the Coalition for a Digital Economy in the UK, to lobby on behalf of legislation which would be advantageous to startups and entrepreneurs, uh, because as I'm sure some of you may have gathered, sometimes entrepreneurship doesn't receive it, uh, its due, uh, its due um, you know, uh, you know, attention in Europe sometimes. Um, I kind of found a co-working space called Tech Hub, um, uh, an event in London called the Europas, which is very much about the European scene. Uh, and I've been an advisor to the Mayor of London when he listens, and thank you, Boris, and, um, and I even managed to get a little bit of airtime with uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, uh, about startups. So. Uh, that's about me. Anyway, so uh, I'm very much just going to give you a little bit of an overview uh, about the scene and a bit about the media, and then we can, um, and my fellow friend, my friends are going to get into the media stuff. So basically, you look like this, uh, which is fabulous. It's a bit of an interesting cluster, um, and it's really, it's really fantastic. And of course, we have 50 years of history plus uh, since the development of the Manhattan Project, Hewlett and Packard in this illustrious building we are named after Mr. Packard. And um, we, and you look like this, you operate in this. Isn't it marvelous? Um, and we look like this, it's a mess. Basically, it's dark, everyone's stumbling around in the darkness. Somebody, occasionally someone's turned the light on, um, as you can see. And so it's really, really fragmented. It's quite different, and it's a fascinating place to operate in. Oh, gosh, you're going to take a picture of that, really? OK. Oh, I'll send it to you for free, if you like. Um, uh, OK. And um, anyway, so we've got to focus on various things. We've got lots of kind of balls in the air that we've got to juggle as journalists. We've got to focus on our local startups in Europe, you know, the ones around the corner, the ones, uh, uh, sometimes they're cloning you guys, sometimes they're coming up with innovation, you name it. Uh, we have to focus on the various uh, vagaries and politics and, and histories of Western and Eastern Europe, and goodness me, isn't Putin causing a lot of fun over in Eastern Europe right now, isn't he? Um, that was obviously irony. Uh, big cities, London, Berlin, uh, big clusters. We're seeing some very interesting things going on. It, well, London is fantastic. It's very. It's actually a genuinely good startup centre. As is uh, Berlin. Berlin became very known as a sort of the tabula rasa of European tech startup cities. Really, there wasn't any kind of big industry there, so uh, lots of artists and galleries and not much else, and occasionally a few government people, and, uh, and everyone else was thinking, oh, what should we do? And off they went, startups. And now, of course, places like Helsinki with, uh, with Rovio, um, Spotify came out of Stockholm originally, of course. Um, and, um, and then we've also got the, this other bull in the air. We've got the juggle, which is uh, the incredible companies that come out of the US, many of them from the valley. And uh, this task of doing this has been aided by the clustering effect of places like of co-working, of accelerators, is make it much easier for journalists to find you guys when you're entrepreneurs over there. Um, and, and this has been also been good helicopter landing pads for entrepreneurs coming into European markets to find fellow entrepreneurs, to find engineers, to find talent, to put down some roots and start up. Um, I'll happily share these slides later. Um, where did I go? There we go. Okay. And then, of course, these clusters now produced the kinds of things that you see up in Soma, uh, down here in Palo Alto, clusters of innovation, people going and bump, bumping into each other over coffee, uh, you know, having lunch, uh, going to the bar, kicking back and, and shooting the breeze about technology. And that's the kind of thing that we saw a few years ago develop in East London in particular. And um, we used to call it uh, in a very British ironic kind of way, Silicon Roundabout. 
uh, as a kind of a little joke on ourselves, really. It wasn't meant to be a branding exercise at all. Uh, and, uh, but uh, a few entrepreneurs uh, basically laid a bet with each other they could get this into the newspapers, and my goodness me, it worked. And, uh, and then we went from there, and the government, the UK government, went on and went, let's do this tech city thing. So they came up with it. I'm, I'm, I, won't, I won't try not to go too long. I'm nearly finished, by, by the way. So uh, and then we, we, we had a little cluster there. That was uh, back in the day. That looks like Windows 95, doesn't it? Um, and, um, and then we got a lot more proliferation. That map is actually far more developed these days. And, um, and then we got all of these guys. Uh, you can actually put these guys all on a map. Um, TweetDeck even there was got acquired just over there um, by Twitter. And, um, and then it, we got some bigger companies turn up because they want to be there as well. So it's in, this is uh, you know, the classic clustering effect, really. Um, and we even got accelerators and venture capitalists going, thinking, let's just do the full stack. Let's go and like do engineers in the bottom, and then angels, and then VCs, and, and then a nice damn roof garden at the top. Um, and of course, in Berlin, something similarly happened. This, is what, this map is actually mostly East Berlin, uh, but you've got tons of companies coming through there. SoundCloud, obviously, one of the most famous coming out of Berlin. And, um, and even Silicon Sautier in Paris. Uh, we all want to have a silicon. We all want one. Um, and uh, uh, although, oddly enough, uh, the per just is so French. Is anyone here French? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, there you are. Good. So French. Now, this is not a commentary on you. The commentary on somebody in the government, the French government, said, oh, we cannot have these, these startups in the one place. In Paris, they must be at over la Défense, miles away from everyone else. All these guys wanted to hang out in the coffee shops and the bars, you know, the real Paris. And uh, somebody said, oh, no, we must move them in a very sort of French project way. But it's OK, they didn't move, and they stayed where they were. Um, and, of course, we can graph this and that amount of Wi-Fi, amount of coffee. And it's, it's uh, I'm sure you're at university, aren't you? So you like graphs. So, um, and also drinking. Fantastic drink, silicon drinkabouts. This really, really is, I mean, obviously I'm British, so uh, this is incredibly important to the whole thing. And we even managed to attract some of your number. There's, Mr. De there's Dennis there from Foursquare. And uh, some of these guys have now moved over here. So you might even see them in a bar in San Francisco. Um, and of course, startups and clusters are sexy and they make great media stories, ladies and gentlemen. We love sexy startups. Um, even guys with beards ended up in the media. And yeah, you know, speaking of someone who occasionally grows a beard, that was incredibly exciting to me. So uh, even in fashion magazines, incredible. I mean, the media really jumped on this. Um, uh, goodness me, who the heck is that? Um, now, but to, more seriously, we have had a proliferation of blogs in each country who've taken the charge forward. The next web originally came out of Amsterdam, then went global. TechCrunch, of course, you know and well. By the way, just a point, a little point, we are no longer, we don't really have, we don't really have a sort of TechCrunch Europe. That doesn't really exist anymore. We have a team who cover European startups. And if you want it, you can go to techcrunch.com slash Europe. And then basically, that's all, the, all our coverage. Um, GigaArm has a guy in Berlin, um, lonesomely knocking out stories. Rude Baguette came, um, was actually, an American, uh, Liam, who, uh, who has created a great little uh, blog about French startups, Silicon Alley in Berlin, Arctic startups in Helsinki, and the list goes on and on. There's Netokratia in uh, Croatia, you name it. There's a, there's a TechCrunch clone all over Europe. Uh, tech EU, of course, as well, uh, started by one of my former colleagues from TechCrunch. Um, and so the challenges are the market fragmentation uh, and competition for stories and, you know, the ear of people. And the opportunities are that there are going to be some damn big stories coming out of Europe over the next few years. It's already started. And these unicorns, as we love to call them now, the big billion-dollar companies, will feed into these wider ecosystem. And as you say, uh, as, the, as the phrase goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. And of course, we can see this wonderful graph here. When, when you get tech crunched, you've got the trough of sorrow. Oh, no, it didn't work. Um, and then eventually, you get uh, in the Wall Street Journal or something. Ha, ha, ha. So um, 
And we are getting our own unicorns, we're getting our own PayPal mafias, our own investors are going, going off and doing new things, and that's feeding into the ecosystem as well. So we can have some questions now or later, but thank you so much for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, we have time for two quick questions for Mike. Actually, I've got a mic. Okay. Any questions? Yes. When somebody comes and emails you and pitches you, what are the kind of the key things that would jump off the page to make you think, I want to write a story about this? Well, one of the problems is that people want to tell your entire, their entire life story at the right beginning, and they'll send you sort of seven, eight, four pages. Um, really, what you want is about three or four major bullet points about who they are, what they're doing, why it might be of interest to TechCrunch or to, you know, to us in the tech media, and, uh, and that's about it, really. I mean, you know, if you can scroll down and read the seven pages of the life story afterwards, if you want to, but that's the main stuff. And you want, it needs to be short, sweet, to the point, um, and uh, you know, don't email the day that uh, uh, Steve Jobs died or something, because we won't be writing about you. Um, one, any idea? One more question. Okay, let's move on to Rosa. Mike, thank you. So thanks everybody for coming, uh, especially your Mexican friends and my Spanish. Hello, Rosa. Okay. <laughs> Ellie. So I'm quite new here. I just came in May, I'll tell you later. Um, my newspaper is called El País. It was uh, founded after uh, just when democracy started in Spain. So in some way we could, we have the chance to start like a new kind of media with no uh, back stories from the past or from like any other thing which was related to dictatorship and all that. So that gave us like a kind of freshness and a, a, an idea of a new Spain and a new way of uh, doing things. And now that our country is changing so quick, so fast, we are just trying to, to keep being what we used to be and to be uh, influential as well. So we are more than 240 journalists worldwide. We are the leading uh, newspaper, not only in Spain, but in the Spanish language. And that's where we try to, to get its uh, key part of our strategy. We have uh, our Madrid headquarters, which is where we were uh, where we are started and we're still like still the big printing unit and all that is cool things. Uh, we have an office in Mexico DF with uh, 10 people. One of them is here, uh, Veronica. Uh, we have an office in Brussels, Sao Paulo, Barcelona, Washington DC and New York. And we are more than 30 correspondents worldwide, but there's, that's the good thing. I came in May with uh, one more colleague in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. We never had anybody here before, although like if California were a country itself, it would be like the seventh economy worldwide. We never had anybody here uh, before, so it's a, a good idea to tell what's happening here, what's the revolution here, and that's what I told my editor-in-chief. Luckily, he used to be the uh, editor for the Americas, and he was based in Washington, D.C., so he had in his mind what uh, Silicon Valley means and what would mean for all the Spanish-speaking countries. Um, we are trying to both reach Spanish but also Portuguese-speaking audiences. We, we have a Portuguese uh, edition made from Sao Paulo. This is something I try to tell all the startups I talk to both in both sides in Spain but also here that if they want to reach Brazil, it would be interesting to tell us or if they are finding some traction there, it would be a good idea to get into that. Um, we are part of an alliance and uh, with some European newspapers, so from time to time we share some stories with The Guardian and some newspapers from um, Poland. It's made the, the, uh, monthly. And we try to be like the quality paper that every country has. So it's uh, politics, international affairs, economics, science, culture, arts, and my part is making tech important as well. So one of the things are uh, more difficult to me, or which I find more difficult, is how to make editors, some of them are like young and are open-minded, but some others are not so young or not so open-minded, or they are just not using apps or things we are using, but they have like the key power of depending of telling what's important on the front page and the website and even the front page and the print edition. So that's part of my job. I like I have to make like good stories, but at the same time I have to go to the point and make them see how important it is. I've been complaining to my friends and they know that I interview the CEO of Yelp 
but I think it didn't have the impact it should have, uh, for example, inside my media that it had outside. So uh, we are finding like journalists in a big media com corporation with so many issues to cover. We are finding social media a key point, a key way to to spread our war and to be like uh, to make it be important. So. I'm quite geeky. Uh, I was part of the like the blog thing and the web 2.0. We had that in Spain as well. <laughs> so I was part of a, a Periodismo Ciudadano, which was like the citizen journalism site in Spain talking about that phenomenon. I went to Bolivia for three months to uh, make like a, a place to teach people how to tell their stories there. Um, uh, and I'm passionate about social media. And uh, when I talked to my boss, I just wanted to get an MBA because I, I had the feeling that I was interviewing so much people in Spain and coming here from time to time. And I, as I told him, I, I think I'm learning all, lots of things out there and there's many things happening, but I think we are not taking them to, to what we are doing in the newspaper. So there's kind of knowledge that is being lost. And he said, okay, well, that sounds fine, it's good, but where do you see yourself in two or three years' time? And I said, well, uh, my dream is become a Silicon Valley correspondent. And I said, I think that's more important than having an MBA. Let's do it, make a plan. And a week later, I was asking for my visa, and I'm here. So good, I, I like him. So we have some challenges. One is the English edition. We also translate some of the most important news uh, into English, which is good. So there's a daily peak of stories translated into English, and I try to become friend of the editors, like to say, let's pick this, this is good, this is good for our English audience. So it's something I also use when I want to get like good stories. Uh, uh, as I told you, the Sao Paulo thing is a good thing because it's uh, an emerging audience. And one of the things I told my boss is that I have the feeling that there are people in their 20s and 30s, in, especially in Mexico, we are growing a lot there and in the south of uh, the United States, that they want to read stories about tech made in Spanish and talking also about them. So one of the things I'm doing the most is talking about some entrepreneurs, European and Spanish entrepreneurs here, what they're doing, but also Mexicans and uh, Latin American here. Um, our business model is both uh, print, which is, which is paying, and uh, web, which is free, and I expect it to be like that for some time. Because I'm, I'm like, I really think that the way to have an impact is to be influential, and you're influential if you spread the word and people can get into it. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think by now. Uh, we also have, we love virals and kittens, like BuzzFeed and all those sites. So we have like our own thing, which is called Berne, like Jules Verne, but we say Berne, which is our viral thing. And um, well, we have a competition with both print media and new players. <laughs> which are born digital and maybe they, they feel free to make new narratives and new things and new ways to tell the story. So for us, it's a bit difficult. For me, it's a big bet being a Silicon Valley correspondent. I try to pay attention to all those European startups that come here. But um, I think it's important to, to think that um, in my country, the financial situation is quite bad, not in LATAM. So when I write for LATAM, it's, 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 yes, so, the opposite, but it's uh, good to talk uh, about um, tech, uh, tech stories because usually you are quite optimistic, it's something that's changing the world, and uh, it's young people and people that are betting hard. Um, we try tech is becoming as relevant as uh, both business and science, and it's uh, being part of our apps. It's an emerging business, and if we look back before the iPhone, it wasn't so big, so it's a big economy that uh, eight years ago it didn't exist. So we have to pay attention to uh, all the uh, wear, wearables and all that. It's a topic itself and it's something you talk about, you ask your friends, uh, which series are you watching right now and what are, uh, apps are you using? That is like a recurrent conversation we have. And um, I'm glad to have here also three or four uh, business angels which are from Spain. So the thing is we haven't had many big exits yet. 
but those who have had some exits or so good stories are really, um, they really know that they have to help some others to make it like the, the snowball go big, big, big and, and go further. We have the 20 story and they've just bought a rocket uh, from Germany. They bought uh, La Nevera Roja, which is uh, coming big. So the idea is try to, to get those stories and those people and try to, to give them the, the, the way to get the door to a, a bigger audience to, to make more people become an entrepreneur in Spain. So that's all. This is Tech as Business, Tech as Entertainment, and Tech as Health. And here in the state is uh, lifestyle, and in Spain, it, I think it's not yet. It's for just people in their 20s, but it's, it's not so, it's difficult. There's still a big gap on, from their 40s to up. So part of the strategy of the newspaper is just having that new audience in, an, in, a, in a newspaper which is almost 40 years old. So, thank you. Rosa, thank you. Uh, one or two questions for Rosa. Yes, sir. Rosa, um, when you get solicited from the outside by either entrepreneurs or by audience, is that a Spanish-speaking audience seeking to tell you a story about Spanish entrepreneurship, or is that a Western audience, Silicon Valley, trying to tell you about what's going on here and to tell that to a Spanish audience? Which, Both which things. Way? I have to try to have a balance. Uh, so I try to pay attention to all those, uh, especially Spanish and Latin people that are coming to Silicon Valley to with their startup to try to make it grow, or especially with something which is like the key point for them is getting into venture capitalist, which is not so easy. You have not from here, you have to find some alleys to do it. So in that side, and, and on the other hand, I also try to tell them, they ask me a lot, people, entrepreneurs from Spain, in a private way, no, nothing to write, like for some advice or if it was coming here and that. Um, I'm going to Barcelona to the Mobile Go Congress, so I'll, I'll see how, how it's going to be, how people are going to tell me things. But um, I think people are trying to get some traction here, and uh, as, you, as you've guessed, I'm just trying to have a balance on the stories, both important things from here that could open their mind there um, in all the Americas and Spain. And at the same time, those who come and are so brave as to try to do it, let's, let's tell the, their story. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Elif. Spain has some of the best business schools in Europe. Uh, are you collaborating much uh, with any of them in terms of covering entrepreneurship and, and what is happening with Spanish students who are starting companies and so coming over here? And mm. No, no, but it sounds good. I, I wish I had a deeper relations. I have some friends in IE, uh, IE, it should be in English, but no, that, that sounds good. If you have the connection with them, it would be great to know where they are coming. And all. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, very quickly, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a journalist for eight years. I uh, spent three years and a half in Paris, uh, then moved to New York. And I was uh, in New York, I was following banks and finance and uh, US politics and US economy. And after two years, I decided to move to San Francisco. So I've been there for two years and a half, mainly covering uh, startups and technology and innovation. Uh, so just uh, Le Monde, it's what we call um, a newspaper of record in France, funded just, funded just, after, just before the end of Second World War, so 1944. We are. Uh, around 300,000 copies a day, and uh, 27,000 of these copies are outside of France, mainly in Europe, uh, in Africa, and we also are uh, in the US and in Canada. Uh, our website is the largest website in France, a news website, so with 14 million uh, unique users. Uh, and we have a lot of readers, and on these readers, the key metric is what we call cadre in French, is like the high-level employees or managers. There is no tradi 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 uh, translation for that. And we are uh, 2.4 million. Historically, the main topic is international news. Le Monde means uh, the world in, in English. And also French politics. Um, since 2012, we really increased increase the focus on business. We launched um, a weekly section. And in May 2013, this section became daily. And so it's 8 to 12 pages every day on economy and on, uh, on business. And it's important for us because it's where we cover tech. There is no section for technology. 
it's on the business section. Um, so this is two graphs I made uh, about the press in France. And like everywhere in, in the world, press is in a bad situation or challenging time. And you can see on your left, it's the circulation of Le Monde, Le Figaro, and Liberation, who are three of the main daily newspapers in France. And we went for 950,000 in 2000 to 7 and 20,000. So like more than 20% drop in 14 years. On the right, you can see it's uh, advertising revenue for all the national daily newspaper in France. And we were at uh, 366 million euros in 2006. And now we are at 209 million euros. So a drop of 40%. 40 and uh, if you can see, if you look just from 2006 to 2013, uh, circulation dropped from around 10% and ad revenue dropped for 40%. So it's very challenging for, for press. I feel like it's even more challenging for press in France than it is uh, in the US. Uh, and one uh, metric we have to, to see is uh, a lot more and more people are, are going online for get, to get their news. And in uh, 2013, internet was only 5% of the revenue of French newspaper. So there is a big shift, and we don't know how to make money with, with, uh, with internet. And it's very important because it affects the way we, we do our job. It affects the way uh, we have the time we have to, to do our job. So I uh, just want to tell you how we cover tech in Le Monde. So I told you we have 8 to 12 pages every day on economy. And on this, there is zero pages who are dedicated for technology. So it really depends. On the day, it can be zero article in one day. It can be one article, one article or two or three articles if it's a good day. Uh, so first thing, we are a very small team. And when I say team, I'm very generous because for now it's only two persons. So one in Paris and me here. Uh, we are the third person who just left. So normally we should be free. So limited space in this newspaper. It's very challenging to get stories in the newspaper. And it's very important and challenging for me and my colleague to make sure we, uh, we can uh, convince our editors. And as I told, we are part of the business section. So it, it change, it's, uh, really affects the way we speak, we speak about tech. We, always, we don't speak about products a lot. We speak more about strategy. We speak about, about, uh, more about business and more about uh, the way it affects um, companies or, or people. Uh, so. And because we don't have a lot of space, we don't do a lot of startups coverage. Uh, you know, when you have to cover Google, Apple, Facebook, and you only have one article a day, it limits the space you have to, to speak about, about other things. We do speak about other things. And you can see on the right, we, we did a profile last two years ago, I think, on Airbnb. Um, but it has, it has to be, when we speak about startup, it has to be something big or something really impacting. And we, I, I got a lot of email from people who contact me with uh, their startups, and it, it looked nice. But no way I can put this on the, on the print. I know there is no, no question it will be on it. Um, and so what we try to do, uh, it's instead of focusing on one company, we try to uh, have articles with broader scopes. So instead of speaking, uh, let's say, uh, Planet Lab, who is doing mini satellites, we are, not, we are doing a, a long article about what uh, the mini satellites mean for, for everything. Uh, and it's really important to, uh, since we are a general publication, we have to appeal to the general public in the way we speak of text, the, the subject we, we pick, and the way we, we speak to. We can't be too technical. Uh, so there is some term we can't say. And when we say like cloud computing, we have to explain what is cloud computing or streaming. We have to explain what is it, because we have to appeal to the most uh, people as possible. And also, so because we try to uh, appeal to the general public, uh, we don't necessarily focus on, on a project. We focus, we focus more on the story behind the company, the impact of the product, and how it will change something. Like, if we, we speak about Airbnb, I'm not going to speak about the website and what's behind the website and how it works. It's more the way how it's changing the business of, um, of hotels. Uh, so, so this is like for Le Monde, but I feel it's pretty much the same thing for all the newspapers in France. It's the way we cover tech. And we have to, you have to understand, too, that there is almost no French journalist here in San Francisco or in Silicon Valley. So most of this is done from Paris. So it changes the way we, we do stuff, too. Uh, so um, 
some other points about uh, tech coverage in general in France. So if you compare it to, uh, to here, it's not as developed. So you have much less publication, you have less journalists, and I feel like you have uh, less interest from, uh, from the readers too. So all the time, it's always business, always, never on tech. So there's no, uh, I mean, I'm speaking for the general newspaper, not for a specific publication, but it's always on the business section, not on the tech section. So it changed the way we speak. And as I say, we don't speak necessarily about products. Uh, in terms of the way we see technology, uh, a lot of people, for a lot of French and a lot of French journalists, technology is Silicon Valley. So if something happened here, it's necessarily more important than what happened in France or what happened in Europe. So sometimes it's kind of uh, tricky because if you have two startups, one French, one American, we, are, we tend to speak more about the American one because the American one is bigger and like have a larger scale, larger money too. So for, for you, it's, it's a good thing. For, for French startup, it can be more challenging. Um, so also, if you have a French CEO or a French executive in your team, it's always great for you because yeah, there is a, a bigger interest. And one example is a lending club. When we did the IPO uh, last year, there was a lot of coverage of lending club in France because the CEO is French. So um, I mean, Normally, you should not have as much coverage, but CEO was French, so French press was interested about it. So it was, there was a lot of coverage about it. Uh, but even if I, I can sound pessimistic, really, uh, I feel like the interest for, for technology stories are really increasing, is really increasing in France. And I see that some stories I, I, read, I write uh, today uh, would not have been published two years ago. So it's pretty much good, and we're trying to, uh, to get better, especially for us. And, for the newspaper too. I would just like to finish with like really small tips with French press. So French journalists are very different than American journalists and it can be difficult to, to, to deal with them. So first, uh, AFP, AFP is like Agence France Press, it's like the French AP. It's really, really important. If you, want, if you need to, to uh, focus in one publication, it's the one you have to, to focus, in, focus on. Uh, this is the way most of journalists and most of editors get their news. So if you are on the AFP, you will reach them very, uh, in a very uh, efficient way. Another thing when you contact French journalists, try to be formal. We don't really like people who are too friendly. <laughs> That's true. It's true. That's true. <laughs> so just try to be formal, and after you can be more friendly after that. And also, uh, if you can't, just speak French or write in French. And uh, so it's, I think it's a minority, but I'm always uh, impressed that by the number of French journalists who don't speak English or don't want to speak, don't want to deal with English speakers. So if you speak French or you have somebody in your team to speak French, maybe to start it would be better to, to start to, French, to speak French. And the last thing, it's something you don't really do here in, in the States, but we love press conference and we love press breakfast. So if you want, so if you want to, to have an informal first meeting with a, a journalist, it's better to invite him to have breakfast or coffee or something like that instead of doing by the phone or going at, uh, at your office. There we go. That's it. So questions for Jérôme. <laughs> yes. I remember, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, there was the French government initiative, La French Tech, I yeah. think, to support French tech companies abroad. And there's a lot of controversy on the effectiveness of that. What do you think, like from your side, did it really help you know, uh, raise the, the awareness of French technology companies internationally, or did nothing really come of it? Um. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to get you in trouble. No, 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 no. no. He's a journalist. He's supposed to say what he thinks, uh, not uh, <laughs> to be too polite. Shoot. No, I Tell think. Tell us what you think. <laughs> I take, to be honest with you, I don't know because I'm not covering French startups. So this is uh, the thing. I'm always focusing on U.S. startups. Uh, I think it's an effort. Some people don't like it. Some people think government should not be involved on that. But uh, if you went to CUS this year, there was a lot of French uh, startups. So 
I feel like they got a lot of coverage for that. I don't know if it's going to change anything or going to uh, affect the way we think about entrepreneurship or innovation in France, which is very different of the way you are thinking here. But at least it's something. It's, I guess it's better than nothing. If I may, I do know that the French staff community that I'm connected with were really quite um, happy that suddenly the French entrepreneurs were being recognised at the highest levels. It's incredibly important. Uh, they'd been ignored for so long, and part of there had been a kind of sclerotic culture which had developed uh, in some levels of French business which was not uh, built around innovation, wasn't interested in anything new particularly, and many of the newer, newer startups and entrepreneurs were very frustrated about this and they wanted the recognition and when the recognition did come, it was at least of some Philip to their own, you know, enthusiasm around their own scene and also, you know, sent the right kinds of signals to the international community and to investors. Yes, last question for Jérôme. Yes, um, on, on the topic that, that was just raised, uh, what strikes me in France is the obsession about the tax label which the government distributes like the legal one. And it's an unfortunate top-to-down process where the government will give you the French tech label if you're a tiny company which may not be involved in high technology, but it's, it's, a, it's a company. You will give a French tech label to cities. Um, some cities are recognized as tech cities like Nîmes or Toulouse. And, uh, you will build in Paris the Alpha Cine uh, a year from now, which is a free space for high-tech companies. But what's unfortunate is that it gives the impression that it's really top-down and the government is deciding for you. Uh, is it something which you're trying to counter or, 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 to, or to criticize or to look at? What about grassroots initiatives? What happens when you don't have the label given to you by the government and maybe a few subsidies? Mm -hmm. What happens? Mm -hmm. Uh, so personally, I really don't write with, about that. So, it, but I, I think that um, you know we are a very uh, government is very important in France, so it's always um, it's always involved to anything what's going on, anything is going on in France. So there is a lot of, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, government implication, and I think it's still better than nothing. It's, it has to come. It's more symbolic than anything else. As, as, as Mike say, we, we don't value entrepreneurship in France. We don't value startups in France. So or we used to not do it. So I think that if the government is trying to do this kind of thing, it's to try to have a, an impression and to try to, um, to make people feel better about it. Uh, I know a lot of people are criticizing, criticizing this because they think that government should not be involved. And you should let the entrepreneur do their stuff on their side. And it should be so easy that they, will, they should uh, be successful by their own. But it's, unfortunately, it's, it's may, maybe not the case because we don't have the same ecosystem, the same money ecosystem, the same uh, VC ecosystem. So maybe government has to be involved to, to help them to, um, to do that. OK, thank you, Jerome. So I work for Wirtschaftswoche. And that's even for German speakers, it's kind of a tongue twister. I think Burton was pretty, pretty close, but it was a big challenge when I came here in 1998 to explain to American speakers what Wirtschaftswoche is. And so I had to spell it on the phone uh, a lot of times. And after a while, I just uh, gave up because it's, uh, if you have counted it, it's like uh, 16 letters. So, and uh, I just said uh, that Wirtschaftswoche is basically the business week of Germany, which it is. I mean, it's uh, very similar to, to Bloomberg Business Week. Um, we reach around uh, 780,000 readers a week in print. And um, it uh, has a very long history. So uh, it was actually founded in uh, 1926 uh, under the name uh, Deutscher Volkswirt, which means like German economist. And um, it uh, belongs uh, now to Verlagsgruppe Handelsblatt, which is the largest uh, business publishing company in Germany. So we have another brand, which is Handelsblatt, which is very similar to the uh, Wall Street Journal. And so several years ago, we actually had a joint venture with Dow Jones to operate Wall Street Journal uh, Europe. But that was be before Murdoch. So actually, so the ties got... Uh, uh, severed and uh, 
Um, and today uh, we reach with, with online edition and with Wirtschaftswoche around uh, uh, 2 million uh, readers daily. And our company basically targets uh, everybody who is interested in business news, financial news, so entrepreneurs, investors, uh, um, uh, business executives, and so on. And uh, one big um, uh, special thing about uh, our company is, is that we have a very extensive global correspondent network. And we have kept that over the years. So it's not only me. Uh, for Wirtschaftswoche, but I have uh, two colleagues in San Francisco who are working for Handelsblatt. And so Handelsblatt is also, I think, a very funny sounding name and there's also a nice story to that name. So a friend of mine, so she was a correspondent for Handelsblatt and uh, one day she got approached by an American uh, founder and he said, why the heck do you have a, a, a correspondent here in San Francisco? Why would your readership be interested in, in, in internet? Uh, and it turned out that he uh, was thinking that she worked for Hunters Club. So that's basically how it sounded. And so the, he was assuming that the, the uh, newspaper was more about hunting rifles and hunting ducks. So, um, but uh, so we, uh, we are uh, publishing in German, but we also have an, an, an English uh, edition uh, called Handelsblatt Global Edition which is a digital edition, and uh, you can check it out on the internet. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, at the moment it's free, so. Um, so Wirtschaftswoche has very strong uh, coverage of uh, technology, and that's how I actually joined the magazine back in 1995. Um, so um, back then, actually, you had to have uh, at least two university degrees and a PhD in economics, actually, to get accepted at Wirtschaftswoche. And I'm actually a college dropout, so, and, uh, which I think is an achievement here in Silicon Valley. <laughs> I don't know if I can say that here in Stanford, but uh, so that, that was the case. And uh, I got invited, actually, to, to join Wirtschaftswoche because I already uh, was a well-known techno technological writer in, in, in Germany, so covered technology. And, I said to my editor-in-chief, uh, I said, well, uh, I would love to join, but I'm actually not qualified, so I don't have the university degrees. And he said, well, you don't need that because you're actually going to write about the internet. So that was kind of weird. Back then, I was the only one, so, and, uh, so you didn't have to have a university degrees or a PhD, actually, to write about that, and that was my advantage. So I, I joined uh, Wirtschaftswoche, and uh, my dream was always to go to California and uh, so in 1998, uh, opportunity opened up uh, to move here. And uh, so I established our Silicon Valley office. That was actually before the first dot-com bubble. I think uh, uh, Google was not even founded. Uh, so I settled in Mountain View. And um, then I left for like uh, 1999, 2000 actually to found an internet startup in, in Germany which is still around today, and it, um, uh, I sold my stake to a publishing company, and so that's why I have really an uh, appreciation for entrepreneurs, because I know how hard it is actually to establish a company. So it's sometimes easy to write about it and to criticize, but uh, I also learned a lot uh, for myself, and uh, I can tell you that's uh, not a good thing to start a company with five co-founders. I would strongly advise against that. So that really invites trouble. Uh, and uh, so since uh, 1999, I actually have been writing a Valley Talk, which is a weekly column in Wirtschaftswoche. It's uh, about entrepreneurship, ideas, uh, what's going on in Silicon Valley. And that's actually very widely read. And uh, other than that, we have really extensive profiles of companies. So. Um, I just did a cover story about Elon Musk. Uh, we had one of the first stories about Tesla. And so I, being here since 1998, I saw a lot of companies actually growing up, like uh, Google. I think uh, I met Google when they had like 25 employees. Facebook when it was uh, uh, very small and uh, did a lot of interviews with, uh, with uh, CEOs in Silicon Valley. and. Uh, one highlight was an uh, uh, interview with Steve Jobs, uh, which was uh, kind of interesting because uh, the PR people actually really drove me crazy. 
So uh, it, they were really frightened of him and uh, was like, okay, you can talk to Steve, but don't ask anything about the future, don't ask anything about the past, nothing personal, <laughs> and, and don't be offended if he just walks away and if, uh, perhaps he's just having a, a, a bad day, it's nothing personal. <laughs> so it uh, was, was, was kind of funny, but it was actually a very good interview, and, uh, but uh, yeah, very, very, very unusual. And uh, my task is basically to provide a German point of view. So basically, uh, we are looking for interesting stories. Uh, it doesn't have to be a German startup, but uh, there has to be some impact uh, for a German reader. So a, a trend or, or something new or just an interesting story. So at the moment, I'm writing a story actually about um, a German-born entrepreneur who is actually a specialist in robotics from Carnegie Mellon and was a specialist actually for, for landmine recovery. And he just uh, decided to start a, a games company, a new game company, a toy company uh, in San Francisco. And we are uh, looking for those uh, kind of uh, unusual story, which are really, really uh, well read and liked by our readership. So what are the opportunities? Uh, what is the challenge for, for the publishing company I'm working for? It's actually uh, uh, the, the same. So it's basically opportunity is living and breathing digital. And so we are now on iPad, we are on smartphone, we have a very uh, big uh, web presence. Uh, the challenge is actually how to earn money with that. And uh, uh, back in 2000, um, so one of uh, the, the deals I had with, with my contract basically in, included that I had to go back to Germany like once a year because I also edited a technology section of uh, Wirtschaftswoche, which was like the cash cow of uh, the whole magazine. And back then uh, we had like 400 pages and uh, we had to decline advertising because uh, they couldn't actually print the magazine anymore. It was too much pages in it. So we had to decline advertising and those times are, are over now. And uh, um, we are still profitable. So it's actually, it's never been, uh, we have never lost money. But, uh, uh, and digital revenue is also increasing. On the other hand, it's not enough to offset the loss in, in, in print advertising. And that's uh, a challenge uh, for all traditional media in Germany, how to deal with that. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, uh, we have uh, the highest readership we ever had. On the other hand, the advertising revenue has significantly declined. But but still, so we have a publisher and uh, a CEO who is actually a journalist who believes in quality journalism. So we are still spending money on having an extensive uh, um, international correspondent network because we believe that you have to have people on site who actually uh, judge by themselves what's, what's going on and can give like an European angle to a story. Okay, ah, okay, that was my last slide. Um, so Burton asked actually about, so what can we learn from, from Silicon Valley, uh, from, from Europe actually, a Silicon Valley. It's uh, funny because usually it's uh, a different question, what, what can we learn from, uh, from, from Silicon Valley? So we have uh, visitors uh, almost weekly from Germany who want to know uh, what Silicon Valley is about, how, what, what can we learn, what can we copy. Uh, so it's hard to tell what we can really learn from Europe. And I was really thinking hard about it. But um, the only thing I came up with uh, was like the lifestyle in Europe. So I'm originally from Berlin and I'm like twice a year in Berlin. And uh, we have a really vibrant startup scene there as well. And the one thing I really um, value is that uh, Europe is not all about work. It's also about life and enjoying life. And here in Silicon Valley, it seems to me often it's, it's all about work. It's about chasing money and uh, not so much about uh, enjoying life. I think that's still an um, um, advantage of Europe. Uh, the other thing uh, is, for like 10 years ago, I would have told you that Europe is an example in privacy and uh, we should look up to, to Europe and customers are going to appreciate that. And that advice would have been wrong. Uh, 
because I mean, look at Facebook, uh, look at other companies. So we have a lot of regulations in Germany, and uh, Germany and uh, German startups actually can do certain things uh, like Facebook can here in the States uh, because we have that we have that regulation. And um, I don't know how that's going to be uh, play out. So I actually I grew up in Eastern Germany. And I still remember that uh, the government spied on citizens and everything, so I have a, a different point of view on that. Uh, and perhaps uh, we're going to see a backlash. I mean, it's already forming uh, somehow that people are more reluctant about using uh, social media or sharing everything. But right now, it's actually a disadvantage in Europe that you can't do certain things. And that's, yeah, that's up for discussion there. Yeah. Matthias, thank you. Uh, why don't we go into general panel Q&A, and we'll follow. I have a question for Matthias. And now we're going to switch to the mics on your tables. Um, so I'll start off with the first question. Um, my impression, just doing a straight head count, is that of the European media today, the, it's the British and the German press that are probably most heavily represented in terms of numbers. So you have The Economist here. You have Financial Times. Um, there may be a couple of other British news, news media I'm, I'm not familiar with. You have from Germany, Der Spiegel, you have Handelsblatt, you have Wirtschaftswoche, and probably a few other organizations. Um, who else would you say from Europe is active here in terms of coverage from, from the media side? Yeah, Ros. Well, there's Teresa here, which is a good friend, and she came in September here. Teresa. And she works both uh, okay. here. And uh, I recommend uh, Spanish startups and European go into her. Because she's uh, working for EFE, which is the main, main uh, wire, news wire for all, like me, for Spanish-speaking countries. So you can get it like what you were saying about a AFP. Like, it's, it's the way to get not just my newspaper, which is big and important, but to go to spread the word into lots of publications in all that time. And, and both Spain is good, could be the right way. But the bad thing is we don't find yet more newspapers, more bloggers, and more things in Spanish. So having two people here is like a way to see if uh, avant-garde and more people are coming to know. OK. Questions? Yes. I was about to say that I'm the only Nordic correspondent here. And so could you identify I'm, yourself? I'm Samuel Larsen from Gaupalet, which is like the Wall Street Journal of Finland. Finland. Mm -hmm. Helsinki. Yes. OK. Welcome to Stanford. <laughs> uh, questions? Or did you have a question to follow? No, no, no. OK. Yes, sir. I just had a question for Matthias. Uh, I've been involved with the consumer-facing stuff for the last year now, which has a couple of thousand users in Germany. And the big difference between our German users and ones in Britain and France and, and Spain is that they're very, very conscious of their privacy. So whenever they leave our app, they'll ask for us to delete all their data. And I'm just wondering, is that something you think is more indicative of the last few years post the NSA, or is that something that's a much deeper cultural ingrained sort of preference? I think it's both that's ingrained in the culture, but uh, now with all the NSA scandals, uh, people are more wary about it. But, but still, I mean, uh, I don't know how many stories I have uh, written about how important data privacy is. If you offer, like, let's say, a, a bonus or you offer a discount on, on your website, I mean, nine out of ten Germans would go for it if they would have to give up some information. So there's a lot of talk about data privacy, but uh, um, in the end, um, um, people use Facebook in Germany as well. The only difference is, for instance, uh, I talked to one of the founders of Sing, and which is like the LinkedIn of, of uh, Germany, and they couldn't do certain things on Sing, like uh, like uh, collecting information of their users, uh, what LinkedIn, on the other hand, could uh, could do. So they had a, a, a business disadvantage. And so right now, everybody is talking about NSA and hacking and so on. I think it could actually could actually be an opportunity for startups in Europe if we have real privacy laws and data laws which are lacking here in the United States. It could be a benefit. Uh, I know certain startups in Germany who are working on uh, secure uh, email and those kind of uh, things, 
which uh, I think you, you can't do in the United States. I think Obama was very adamant that he wouldn't allow encryption of emails and that kind of stuff out of uh, national security reason. And I don't know how it's going to turn out in Germany, especially now with all the confrontation with Russia and so the, uh, the, uh, all the, the threats, the terroristic threats and so on. But, but right now, I would say it's, it's an opportunity, actually, for, for startups over there to start a service focusing on, on privacy and security. Any other panel members want to comment? I can, I can comment. I mean, look, I think you've got to look at the historical context of this, obviously. Um, World War II, you had the Nazis who were incredibly, you know, they, 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 that was the early, one of the earliest surveillance societies. And then in Eastern Germany, it was a, 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 you know, surveillance, uh, you know, beyond that anyone had ever, ever seen, and the communists. Now, then, uh, when the Cold War went, uh, when the Cold War ended, um, you, you had that hinterland, therefore, fed how European, uh, main, Western Europeans uh, legislated. So you've got to think about that for starters. But it's 2014, and we have a new generation of young people today who are on Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter, and they live their lives in a different kind of manner. Um, that said, it's something that always comes up in, in public discourse about privacy uh, and surveillance. And of course, we've had the recent revelations about the NSA, the Edward Snowden revelations. So it, of course it comes up. Um, but at the same time, uh, other U European entrepreneurs are doing a couple of things. I, you're absolutely, he, he is absolutely correct that there are uh, now services offering uh, secure level emails and things like that. Um, and then there are others who are simply uh, offering uh, services which are on a par with something that you might have seen out of Silicon Valley uh, because it's there aimed at a different kind of generation, They're not aimed at uh, people who are particularly uh, worried about these kinds of issues. They, they, they want the kids, or the kids are all right. The kids want to get out there and do stuff and they want to use these platforms. You can't, you can't stop them. I interviewed... Uh, Neely Crows, who was just recently stepped down as the head of, the, was the digital European commissioner, and um, she was uh, extolling how the Europeans had recently enacted the right to be forgotten laws and enforcing Google to wipe out uh, certain types of information on the requests of users. And, and I just said to her, well, you know, young people don't use the right to be forgotten, they use Snapchat, which is immediately forgotten, well, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Well, I hope mine is anyway. Um, so, so it, it is a generational thing. Um, so we can't paint Europe in one big brush that, you know, my goodness me, they want to lock all the data down and surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. That's not necessarily, necessarily the case. Of course, it is a much more complex regulatory environment. And many of startups I know, sometimes they actually base themselves out of Germany to begin with because they know then, therefore, that, they can, that they've done all of their you know, checks and balances about privacy and surveillance, et cetera, and they can actually roll out a service um, pretty easily because pretty much everyone else is much more lax. Um, yes? Um, I think it was just part of a throwaway comment, but Matthias, she said something about writing with the European slant. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to... to get a hold on it. I mean, if I want to know what's going on, I need to read a report in seven newspapers, because each one will have something different. But can you describe, or can any of you describe the European slant? I mean, obviously, you just said it wasn't one monolithic country, which we know. Yeah, I think one, one example, I would say, it's like uh, Uber. I mean, um, there are a lot of stories out there how fantastic the service is. On the other hand, Uber is breaking a lot of laws. Uh, and I think that's also the, the history of Silicon Valley, and it's one of the reasons uh, uh, Germany or Europe doesn't have a Google. In, uh, in Silicon Valley, it's all about breaking the rules. So Google, the founders, never asked permission to call websites. YouTube never uh, cared about having copyrighted content on it. Uh, so, and Uber didn't care that there were actually certain laws or local laws. They just started the service. And that's very un-European, I mean, or at least very un-German. So Germany is all about rules, and you have to obey rules. And you expect other people to obey those rules uh, as well. And so that's, that's German nature. And I would say a lot, 
like something like Uber wouldn't have started in, in Germany. So because people wouldn't have dared actually to do it. So um, uh, what I want to say is like the European uh, angle is also to look what is the impact on society. Uh, so what are the downsides actually of Airbnb, which is also a perfect or nice service. But uh, if you think about how it could impact the hotel, hotel industry, how it could actually cut a lot of uh, low income, but, but still jobs. So that are some of the angles we are looking uh, at. So I, I'm not about just uh, praising Silicon Valley or everything is fine. I also try to look at, okay, what, what is the downside? Uh, Constanza? Uh, I work with several uh, Latin American countries, and we have a problem there of lack of interest in science and technology uh, for students and young uh, uh, boys uh, and girls. There is any trend that you have uh, detected in, in Europe after you started covering Silicon Valley, the cool of creating companies with technology? Have you identified any positive trend in the number of students in science and technology increasing the interest in those topics? Well, in the UK, um, oh, sorry, are you talking about? Did you want to talk about? Sorry, um, in the UK, we can't get enough of it. It's gone crazy. The code clubs. The prime minister is all over it. He renamed Silicon Roundabout Tech City. Uh, goodness me, it's like having Coca-Cola come and visit. Um, he, uh, there is enormous amounts of public discourse about getting kids into uh, science courses, and they really do, you know, they're, they're really trying hard. I mean, we, we basically went down this, even though Britain produced, you know, the BBC Micro and the ZX81, all these old 1980s computers were actually some of the first computing platforms ever, home computing. Um, we really went down a strange kind of disc, uh, direction, you know, just teaching kids how to use Microsoft Word and Excel instead of teaching them how to program and, you know, code stuff. And, and that's all changed now. In the last two years, totally now, we've moved towards uh, real trying, try, really trying to get young people involved in, in STEM uh, courses and education. Um, and and I, I mean, I do, I do see that generally across Europe as well. There's massive, uh, there are lots of uh, people who are, yeah, um, the evangelists of that in every country across Europe is just whether or not they are heard at the highest levels or not. But see, certainly, I mean, I mean, much to my uh, amazement, uh, the British uh, government did respond to that. Uh, I think we have like the uh, responsibility of uh, giving them some examples to make them interested in getting into code and tech, and to see how some people are having a good way of living and a good story to tell, even if they fail, to, to have like a plain life and, and to see that you can make things with your hands and maybe not so much money. But at the same time in Spain, I think there are just some little incubators. Uh, Kike knows about one which he worked with and uh, also my friend Gonzalo. So they uh, in Madrid, Mallorca, Barcelona, they're trying in Seville, in Valencia there's one. So I think they are making March, uh, the job like the government should have been doing or maybe universities try to make people get into it. So sometimes there are some people that they don't have like the, the, stu the, the uh, education to do that, but they're really encouraged to, to make like their own path and try to, to get into it. So we have like a big uh, amount, a big piece of uh, passion, which is something that makes us in a way different from um, Latinos. So that's the, the good thing. But at, on the other hand, we still need some more, more uh, like official support and some more education to get to, to stay on, on, the, on the red line. Oh, I, I would say it's the same thing in France than in Spain. <coughs> that's true. <laughs> Please, you're home. No, no, it's really the same. It's, I think it's pretty much the same thing where we have a lot of education to do for kids. And so one of the debate nights to know if we should teach kids how to code in school. So I'm pretty sure there are the same debate everywhere. Um, but yeah, we, and, and, and what we have in France, we, as, as George Bush used to say, there is no word for entrepreneur in French, even if entrepreneur is a French word. But we don't, we don't value entrepreneurship, or we don't use to value entrepreneurship. So. And we don't, we don't value failure. If you fail, you're a loser. That's true. Yeah, yeah. 
so if you fail, you, you're done. You, you can't do anything else. No, you will never find money anymore. Nobody will. So it's a lot of education process uh, for kids. Uh, and this is maybe why we have uh, a, a role to play. It's to show that if you're a kid and if you're dedicated and you try very hard, and you may be successful. Maybe you won't, but at least just try and you can be successful. And we, we have, uh, uh, in France at least, this, this barrier when, why should I try? Why, why should I give me a chance to fail? But I can just get a job and be safe instead of trying to fail. It's also changing. You've got um, young people basically are taking control of their own future. Uh, the gentleman over here questioned whether or not uh, there were any initiatives at government level were in encouraging things. Well, young people just took control of it themselves. You had the Silicon Sentier, an organization in Paris that created their own co-working spaces. Uh, then, now it's become Numa Paris. You have an organization called Le Family, which is absolutely knocking it out of the park. They can't get enough of it. Um, and it's because uh, they're basically tired of having to wait for some government official to pat them on the head and say, yes, fantastic, off you go. They're, you also got to put this, uh, remember that you've got to think about the background of the European economy uh, has been so abysmal in the last few years. Um, the youth unemployment in Spain and uh, Portugal, Italy is terrible. There are no jobs, and this has now not just um, become an opportunity for entrepreneurship, but there's nothing else to do. They must get out there. And they've got, they are, that is why you have had a seismic change in young people saying, listen, you know, we're just going to go and, you know, we've heard the internet's good, let's go and do that. You know, there's a job there. Uh, there's something to do, and that's why you've now had other people come up through the ranks and say, listen, go, go to the legislators and say, we need better bankruptcy laws. We need to be able to fail. We do not want sort of a, a personal, uh, you know, 20,000 euro uh, bill over our head if the company fails. We want, need to have proper Chapter 11 laws. We need to have kids who code. We need to put in new infrastructure. And that has been the debate that's happened over the last five years in Europe at the European level, at many governmental levels, now that many of them are a hearing. I mean, uh, I hear incredibly good things about the new uh, digital minister in France. Um, and uh, so it is happening. We are sort of on the cusp. We're, we're pivoting right now. Um, but I'm uh, sorry, I feel like I don't want to dominate. But this is, this is a, this is a, you know, I'm trying to get this across here. It's not, it's not sort of like the old Europe that you know and read about in the newspapers and the books, whatever. It is, it is changing. There is a sort of a, hint, a, a groundswell of stuff going on. I think it's worth, worth pointing out here that the role of media, uh, business media, news media in Europe, play a very large role, very important role, in shifting these societies, cultures, economies towards entrepreneurship and innovation because of the huge readership they have and because of the very high standing of journalists such as these in, in Europe. Here in the Valley, you know, we don't look to the San Francisco Chronicle and Merck, great publications, but we don't look to them for, uh, for culture change, to lead the charge. Uh, they basically report on the scene. In Europe, it's individuals, publications such as these, the, the columns they write, uh, the, the stories they report on, uh, which get interpreted back into the local culture context, historical, political context, have a huge impact in moving forward entrepreneurship in building support for private sector programs, for changes, for changes to laws in parliament. Uh, and, and pushing, pushing governments in, in the right direction. So it's an important under, distinction between the role of news media here uh, versus Europe. Uh, next question. We, we're going until 6 o'clock, so we have a few more minutes. Uh, any, any questions over here on this side? Okay. Aleph. You know, I was following up on the last point about creating jobs and so on. I was curious whether there is an emergent maker movement in Europe, like you've seen here, and whether you're reporting on that, and, and if there is any interest in that kind of thing in, in Europe. Oh, I, because I think there's a great connection between that and entrepreneurship and building things. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> you've got the Maker Fair down in Brighton, just down. Uh, you've got uh, new makers, uh, Maker Academy in, in London, in Somerset House. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's robot. I mean, you've got to remember also that, you know, when you talk about makers and things like that, you've got enormous long history of uh, 
uh, science and technology which feeds into things like robotics in, in Europe. The UK and well, I mean, Europe. I'm sure these guys have, uh, you know. Some Same thing in France, so there's a big moment. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is, there is a big movement too, and um, especially in north of France. And you, you, you can't look, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle, right? You know, we've heard of the internet, okay? We've heard of Arduino, we heard of all of these things. You know, we read TechCrunch, we read uh, all the other, you know, stuff that you read in English or whatever language you want. And um, so it's genie's out of the bottle, broadband is out of the bottle, it's all there. It's just whether or not you can scale a company like in a, in a market size of France or Spain or Germany or you access an enormously large market like the US with your project or startup, um, that kind of a thing. You know, it's access to big markets and it's access to venture capital as well, which is another important aspect of this. Um, you know, the, the number of VCs in Europe is far less than there is in the US. Uh, and that you do not have the vast uh, funds available to the, that they have here, like to Sequoia or, or whoever in the, US, in the Valley versus Index, Axel, Balderton, Partech in Paris, uh, uh, Early Bird in Berlin, etc. They don't have these enormous same amounts of funds. But it's absolutely, of course, it's absolutely happening, yeah. Um, any new questions? Okay, let's see, I believe you had a question and then to you. Yeah, I think uh, I have a job for you, uh, an additional one, if I may say. Uh, there's something very interesting that's happening. You have extremely well-trained French engineers who come to Silicon Valley, work a couple of years here, go back to France. And then what happened? And in fact, quite a few of them, but that should be investigated, cannot stand it in France, and then come back here. And this kind of new breed of sophisticated engineers who, who know what it is like to work with a startup here and go back to France, are disappointed to come back here again, would, uh, I think, make a, a good start. Yeah. Actually, you should, I don't know if he's still here. I, I have no, so, somebody to introduce to you, if you want, who is, who is doing that. I don't know if he's still here. But yeah, yeah. but there is a lot. Um, when, when I said I'm French, a lot of people are saying, oh, you have very good engineers. And that's true. I mean, we have good school. And here in Silicon Valley, you have a lot of French people. And a lot, they still have a good jobs. And it, I feel like it's difficult when you come from here to go back to France when you try. Because you don't make the same salary. You don't have the same. You don't consider as the same, uh, the same way. As an engineer here, you consider as a, as a, it's a good job. And you're very considered. In France, you're not as considered. Because we still have the old, old mentality and old jobs. Will, if you want to have a good job, your mom will never tell you to go work at a startup. She will say, go work at the government or go work uh, at Total or whatever, like a big company. <laughs> so I think it's difficult for them to, to make the switch. But I also see that uh, more and more companies uh, opening, are opening uh, uh, engineers' uh, teams in France because it's cheaper. And instead of paying uh, the French uh, engineers US salary, you can just pay them French salary in France. Uh, yeah, American company. A lot of French companies do, does that too. They come here in the state for, for uh, business, uh, the business aspect, but they're still in France for all the engineering is still in France because it's cheaper. People are more, uh, they don't switch jobs like you switch job in America. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Can I put a hold on you because we have a new questioner in the back? We'll come back to you for your last question. Yes. Yeah, question for Matthias. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to expand a little more on the story that you're covering of this individual or this startup. Um, what made them unique in a sense, or what is the, the value that they're adding to society as, as you know, as, you mean as the a toy company or? You mentioned briefly about the story you're covering of someone. <coughs> Is in the gaming mobile industry. Yeah, so I'm that, just curious. What, yeah, that was just an example of a. That? What potential do you see in their future? Yeah, I, I thought it was just an interesting story uh, uh, to have like uh, somebody who is in robotics, uh, who actually had a lot of offers from the from traditional company and uh, companies, and they decided to actually reinvent toys. To came up with a, with a new version, basically of 
uh, race cars, uh, which are uh, um, uh, with, with integrated processors, so you can actually drive them on, on with, with your iPhone. So you have like a physical object. And it's just a, a very unusual trend because now you see Microsoft, you see Google, you see Facebook with Oculus uh, trying to do virtual things, trying to virtualize everything and no, no real physical stuff anymore. And so that was just one of the stories I, I, I like because it's an interesting angle and here it is even uh, more interesting because you have a German co-founder as well. And uh, so that's the kind of, of stories I'm, I'm looking for. And I've been writing this column since 1999, so, so almost uh, every week. And that's the nice thing about Silicon Valley. So I've never had a problem to come up with interesting stuff. And that's what I, what I really like about here in, in, in Silicon Valley. And uh, it's, it's, was, it's also very widely written in, in Germany, uh, very widely, widely read, sorry, in, in, in Germany and hopefully also in, inspired a lot of uh, entrepreneurs over there. Uh, I remember, so when I, actually I did one of my first stories here about eBay when I, when I came in 1998, so, and of course I didn't understand the whole of eBay, how it would become so big, but um, one week later I got a call from, from a guy from Germany, um, his name was Oliver, and he told me, oh, I read your story, it's really interesting. We are trying to, to do the same in, in, in Germany, so what do you think about it? And I said, well, yeah, I, I like it. I actually just had to sell my stuff in Dusseldorf, so, and I was surprised how many people came and wanted to buy things. And then he started uh, Alando, which later was bought by, by eBay, and they are very well known, like the Zamba Brothers. Uh, in, in Germany with rocket, rocket Internet. So and my hope as a journalist is that I am hopefully I can inspire some people, entrepreneurs in Germany with stories from here to do something similar in Germany and create jobs over there. Um, well, oh, thank you, Lenny. Sorry, we're, we, we've, we've got to start close, closing this down. Sorry. Um, one short, is Let's your question short? <laughs> um, Ma'am, ma I'm sorry, you, we have a couple of questions back up high. Is your question short? Yes, I can make it short. I was just wondering if Europe was going to use big data in a more personal way than the US is because of the smaller pockets. Because you mentioned we have a huge uh, base here to sell things in that's kind of homogeneous in a way. What do you mean big data? All right, so there's... Well, I know what you mean, but I mean, what do you, what well, do you mean? Well, right now, what? they're conglomerating it, and they're not using it to tailor anything to me, except maybe if I looked at something to buy six months ago... I oh, no, 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 no. You, get, you, look, you look at some, um, in London, some of the most sophisticated advertising agencies and platforms in the world are using data to target, uh, uh, you know, people in, in the UK. Um, most of the international media campaigns uh, are using all of the, um, the big data uh, available to them to target consumers or to, you know, to tailor products. Um, it's absolutely happening. Um, it, it, you know, you got to remember that entrepreneurship. They'll, they'll, they'll look at it. You know, as, you know, you're thinking about privacy laws, etc. They still do it. They still get around it. They'll still, you know, cookie or whatever. Just make the cookie disappear, pick it up again. It's it. You, you've you've that a lot of the time, you, the stuff you hear about uh, uh, surveillance or whatever in Germany or whatever, and people rubbing their houses out on Google Maps and Street View and stuff like that, it's just top line politics stuff. Uh, people still want still want decent goods and services, and you know they want Amazon delivered next day. They want that kind of thing. So it's it basically happens anyway, even though you might think. Better job. Oh, can we do a better job? Oh, absolutely. We could definitely do a better job. We, we, we just don't have a big damn market like you guys. We do not have a big... We, we, we ha used to have this fantastic market on our doorstep, uh, which is very large and growing and emerging and pretty sophisticated and love, love uh, Chekhov, etc. But unfortunately, Russia's having a bit of a few issues at the moment. And um, we would, you know, we're looking, hopefully hoping a, a, a certain individual uh, will no longer be heading that country forever, goodness me, uh, uh, because these guys are at least uh, the similar sophistication and similar uh, kind of uh, want things, the same things out of life that 
all Europeans, Western and Eastern uh, Europeans want as well. Uh, but we just do not have these. We have much more fragmented markets, if you remember. So, uh, but um, I mean, but the level of sophistication and products and technology is absolutely it's world class, just as much as as anywhere else. But the thing is, the clever thing is though, is that we can make things um, t that you'll never hear about for a while. Spotify basically solved file sharing for music in Sweden two years ahead of it launched internationally and now you think Spotify is American most of the time right so and because it was in Swedish right so this is the thing we can cl be clever use our own small markets and scale things internationally and then boom like decloak like a Klingon battleship in the middle of space fire all phases and off we go Next question. Yes, so <laughs> last question. Uh, just a final reminder, Stanford students, please see me if you'd like directions to the dinner tonight, reception with the speakers. Uh, our final question, please. So we've been talking about covering companies, but I'm wondering how often investors are covered, particularly investors who've been high profile, had a big exit. Um, I'm just wondering if that shows the somewhat anemic support that investors give to European startups. Do they get profiled? Do you know, people pay attention to? I mean, for, for me, no. Not really. It's, it's, no, it's not really an interest. As I told, we don't have a lot of space. So we try to do something else with the space. But if, if sorry, when, when Google Ventures say we are going to invest 100 million euros, uh, dollars, I don't know, uh, in Europe, yeah, we did something on Google Venture because it was uh, in, in Europe. It's, it's tomorrow a big VC say we are going to invest millions or billions of dollars in, in, the, in Europe, we will do something. But when it's only in the US, not, not really. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm thinking of European um, investors oh. who have done well, sold the company, made some money, and reinvested, made some money. You know, if you begin to make them an example, then people with money might become, mm. they might be an aspirational thing. Mm. So one of the problems we have, it's one of the main French investors is also the owner of the newspaper. So we can't really profile him. It's a little difficult. Is that, is that, is that, is that, yeah. He's amazing. Yeah, so he's the owner of Le Monde, so we don't really profile him. But um, we don't have this kind of, we don't have a lot of big stories like that. We have few people who are investing, and they are profiled when, when they do something, when they buy a new company or when, when, they, when they invest. But it's always the same ones. I mean, it's, and most of the time, they already have their own company, like a legacy company. And so, yeah. Uh, I wish they were much more accessible, accessible for both here in the Valley and uh, also in Europe. But they try to have those who drive the conversation, so they call you when they want, but know when you want to also talk to them, maybe to make a story about investing trends and things like that. And uh, the only feeling or complaint I have sometimes about the Valley is that uh, sometimes they ju just think of of the circle of the valley, but not going out. And in some point, they are, go they are going to have to go out to get some more audience and clients and uh, consumers. So in that way, I think they should think of having a, an impact out from that. And um, sometimes I find that they don't really know my publication. So it's difficult. I have to make a lot of send them like the impact and the insights of the publication. And after they see the impact of the story, they start calling you. So you have like to, to water your plant and stay <laughs> putting the seeds and spend a lot of time instead of writing the stories to go them and not, not also VCs, but also sauces and all that. So I have the feeling that sometimes Silicon Valley is all around itself and not thinking about the impact out of it. Great. You've got, you've got, honestly, I just want to say, you've got to remember also, we heard from Oliver, about Oliver Samware uh, earlier. Um, now, you, you're hitting up sort of cultural differences in Europe. Uh, I interviewed him for TechCrunch a few years ago, um, and he basically walked out of the interview uh, because he did not want coverage. Um, you try and get British, uh, so you try and get uh, Richard Branson off the front page of the newspapers in Britain, you, he, he loves it. 
and it's a totally different attitude to inve amongst investors. Um, now, uh, then you've got the professional investors, the, the VCs, etc., who they're not very keen on on uh, high-profile stuff, and it but it is it tends to kind of go around cultural norms about. Uh, in, in Germany, um, billionaires, etc., don't really like publicity. In, in Britain, it's, they don't really mind it, um, depending on who they are. But, um, but it is different. It absolutely is different. So um, I regret very much we need to wrap things up. Just to give you a heads up, our next session is not next Monday, but two Mondays, February 23rd, where we're, where we'll be featuring our first Latvian startup and also our second Slovakian company. Uh, please, let's give a hand to this great panel.